Aaron. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Sherry, for having me here. I love how you just jumped on it when I said, we should do another show. <laughs> We're definitely due to do the part two, but you know that means there's going to be a part three and probably four, and this, this is just going to keep going. So I'm so happy <laughs> to have you back. You know, you're one of my mentors. I look up to you. I love what you're doing. And I think the last time you were on the show, I don't think you had released Stop Stretching yet both the no. podcast and the book. So you've got a lot of things going on right now. You've been super busy in the last year and a half. So first of all, Yogi, Aaron, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for being here. And I just want to add that when you had me on last time, like I couldn't even conceive of where this has gone since we've spoken. I mean, it's just like if you had said to me, you should write a book, which I think you probably did. I told you to buzz off. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that conversation. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. So, so you, so you wrote the, well, you started first, I think the podcast, we launched the podcast first. And what yeah. was the impact of that? Because you're, you're breaking like massive barriers here. You're telling people to stop stretching and not just, I think the yoga world, but also the whole fitness world. Mm hmm. I, I mean, the reaction is multi-layered. I think that there's a certain group of people that are just so identified with needing to stretch that, you know, and that that's part of who they are. That's their makeup. That's their business, whatever. And so it's very threatening to some people. Some other people treat me like, a you know, their old grandmother that says something cute and they like, here's a shawl for you, <laughs> you know, cover yourself up, stay warm. But there's also a, like a huge swath of people that are like experiencing what I've experienced, which is just persistent injuries over and over and over. And, you know, one of the things I've been reflecting on a lot, especially the last, you know, as I've been doing a lot of interviews since the book came out, but how many times I went to my yoga teachers and, um, or even fitness trainers and said, you know, I'm dealing with this chronic back problem. Oh, and they would use words consistently like we need to open the hamstrings or we need to open those lower back muscles. And I'm just now that I know what I know and I see things through the lens of muscle function, I'm just like, how can we keep we got to stop saying this sort of stuff because it a biomechanically doesn't make sense. But B, you know, if we open the hips, for example, then we're just talking about, oh, we need to dislocate our hips because that's what open hips really means is dislocated hips. And I know so many yoga teachers um, who have spent their, you know, careers opening their hips and now have had, you know, hip replacement surgery. <laughs> so right. we need to stop opening the hips. <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I'm so curious. And as we get into this a little bit more, I, I always kind of ask myself, where did, where did this all start? And I'm so curious as when to this whole, this emphasis on stretching became the thing. Why did we start to incorporate that and make that such a such an important part of our training routine or such an important part of yoga? Do you know a little bit about that, Aaron? Like, why did why did stretching become such a vital component of our health and fitness? I think that I mean it's a I think it's a bit of a complicated answer because you and I think that there's a lot of things that have contributed to it. I think if I had to say, you know, pinpoint it to one thing, and I don't think it's just this one thing, I think it's a, it's a collision of many different things. But one of them is definitely that we look at who our yoga teachers were in, you know, the, you know, the eighties and nineties, uh, when yoga started to become a thing, you know, before that yoga was typically taught, you know, in these kind of secret yoga studios, um, lots of incense burning and, you know, weird hippie people, and it just wasn't accessible to mainstream. And then when it started becoming accessible to mainstream, you know, kind of people who were in the fitness world, these kind of aerobic teachers were requested, hey, can you teach a yoga class? Well, they didn't know what yoga was, they didn't know what yoga should be. But what they did know was, lanky skinny indian men who were very flexible doing these kind of pretzel like postures so it became interpreted that way and then we started seeing um fitness teachers starting to teach yoga standing at the front of the room to loud music 
Right. And, you know, demonstrating consistently teaching something that they shouldn't have been teaching. But now today we see the same kind of thing. We see all these people teaching, you know, yoga classes. Maybe they know a little something about yoga. That is another discussion, but they're teaching to loud music. They're wearing, you know, tight spandex and, you know, all these things. Right. By the way, just for the record, I'm not judging it. I'm just right. pointing it out more like as an observation and kind of like understanding, you know, how we got to where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's interesting because, well, you know, I did my yoga teacher training with you. I think that was in 2021. <clears throat> And when I came back, I started immediately incorporating the Ayama postures that I'd learned with you with my clients. And the first thing I told them was, all right, we're not stretching anymore. <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? But we've been doing this forever. And it was even weird for me to like suddenly, it was like a 360, like, well, I guess it's called a 180, completely different direction, but to completely change direction and say, we're not doing this again. And so it was hard for them to absorb it because we've been so conditioned as that being part of our routine. And even yeah. for myself to start to get comfortable with telling my clients something very different than I had always been telling them for so many years. And so yeah. now that, that they've started doing some of the muscle activation in the beginning and stretching is no longer a component of, of what we do to even warm up, there is massive transformation around lower back pain. I think the majority of my clients suffered from lower back pain and just mm -hmm. by doing those three postures, those are my three favorite ones. I have to do them daily. I also personally see no more back pain. And so have you seen that being received in the same way in the fitness world? Like since you've re released the podcast, since you've released the book, or do you find there's still some resistance? I mean, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Um, I, I think that's going to take a while to flip the script and something i just wanted to add to the conversation is i've been i just finished filming this little video for my youtube channel called the evolution of yoga mm -hmm. and how do we get to stretching and i kind of talk about it in episode five of my st uh, stop stretching series but one of the things that's fascinating to me is like krishna macharya who is considered you know our grandfather of yoga um to what we understand it today but 150 years ago he was sort of the first Instagram influencer who used to go around India, you know, in his little oxen cart and do these yoga demonstrations, which is basically, you know, these yoga quote unquote postures to demonstrate to people like how they could access yoga. And it was the way that he could kind of capture people's attention. If you and I start talking about the importance of happiness and peace and contentment, people are going to go, yeah, whatever. But if we kind of show them something bright and shiny, it kind of captures people's attention. So the way in for a lot of people is these bright and shiny yoga postures, if you will. But over time, we just need to evolve it to something else and, and give them something else to do. But one of the things that's kind of like really touched my heart deeply is just the amount of messages I get daily now mm -hmm. from people who are like, I've been dealing with pain for several years and no yoga teacher has helped me. This stuff is, you know, starting to make sense. I'm finally getting relieved after being years in chronic pain. And it's not just like one or two, it's like consistently now um, that people are doing that. But, you know, one of the reasons why, Sherry, I decided to write the book and do the podcast and start making noise about it was because in my teacher trainings, as you know, um, you know, usually by day six to day 10, everybody becomes pain free. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like a big kind of light bulb for me to see that because usually I would have somebody have some issues and we would stretch it out. But of course, the issues always came back. But then doing this has kind of seen me get people see people get stronger and stay strong, which is where we want people to be. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. And, and as I mentioned, I've experienced it firsthand and it's 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 a year and a half now that i have not stretched and that's really weird to say like i haven't stretched <laughs> in a year and a half and and i will never like there's well i know the poses that we'll never do right which you explained very well in the podcast and and in the book and you know aaron you've said s several times i think i've heard you say that this is this is your life's work i think correct so i don't put <laughs> i don't want to make sure i'm not putting any words in your mouth but i've heard you say that and i'm super curious why is this message so important to you <laughs> that's that's I mean that's multi-layered um I 
have always strived since I was like as young as I can remember, like 13, 14, 15 years old, have been fascinated by this idea of life purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in the translation of, of the Radiant Sutra, not the Radiant Sutras, the Yoga Sutras by my teacher, um, Pandaji says the greatest loss in humanity is a person who doesn't know their purpose or who hasn't lived in purpose. It's the greatest tragedy. Um, and I, I really believe that I believe that, you know, I've lived a very purposeful life and, um, it's what my purpose is, is multi-layered, but one of those is like creating or holding space for other people to kind of melt into their own, you know, sense of purpose and so that's one part of the Ayama philosophy, but the other part of it is also living pain-free mm -hmm. so that we can live our purpose. And I have had to deal with pain, chronic pain for 25 years of my life um, that, as you know, led me to a surgeon's office saying that he might have to do a spinal fusion, which thank God he, you know, still hasn't mm -hmm. um, because of these practices. And I just don't believe anymore that people have to live in pain. I've, you know, had searing neck pain where, where like knife like pain shooting down my arm. It's not necessary, you know, and, and we, people don't have to go and live like that. And then it breaks my heart to see, you know, someone with, for example, shoulder pain going to some sort of quote unquote expert or yoga teacher that's literally trying to pull their arm out of their socket to stretch them. And, and it just breaks my heart to see this kind of, um, you know, this, for lack of better words in this moment, nonsense, keep repeating itself. We don't have to do that. We just need to start educating ourselves more on like proper muscle function. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. So <laughs> if we are not supposed to stretch anymore, Yogi Aaron, what are we supposed to do? Activate. <laughs> you know, I was actually at the gym today, literally today as, as I'm re recording this. And I was doing my uh, shoulder workout today and sort of upper body. And I was doing my preparations and, you know, activating. And But I was reflecting on what, you know, the even like eight years ago version of myself would have been doing by bringing one arm up, stretching, you know, the, the, the pecs and the delts and in the lats. And, and then I would go and put weight on them and expect my body to perform well, which it didn't. And I never understood why it didn't until now. And I, today I was actually at the gym and I was watching this younger guy who's probably 25, you know, doing all of these things and then going and doing pull-ups. And it was like, no. And I had to fight every single fiber of my being not to go and invade his space. I can totally picture you there, like, like going bananas, like trying to talk to this guy, but really not approaching. And that must be so frustrating for you, just being in in that gym environment and seeing all these things and of course not taking time away from your own training to go yes. to, to speak to others so what can we do like first of all actually before we get into what we can we do maybe we just break it down to the audience what is ayama so ayama is applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation and you don't have to be a yoga person to do it i just threw the word yoga in there because that's my main audience but this applies to anybody who's using their body period. Even if you use your body to go shopping, you need this, <laughs> you know? And so the applied part is really, we learn about anatomy. So many of us have learned about anatomy by drawing and coloring charts or having somebody lecture us from the front of the room, but it's never felt inside of our body. So when I'm teaching a pose and I'm always trying to do this, like we're doing this pose to activate this muscle do you feel this muscle? And that becomes experiential so that the muscle is no longer this abstract idea. The body itself is no longer abstract. My mother actually sent me a message the other day and she was telling me like she went to yoga and it was one of the very first times in a long time that she actually felt the muscles and knew what the muscles were that she was using. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that's what I want, because we, you know, if we understand some very basic ideas about anatomy, it's a game changer. and We can like start to change our life. And then the muscle activation part of it is instead of stretching, we're actually 
starting to promote better muscle function uh, so that we have more stability. And when we have more stability, then we have less pain in the body. Right. So you're it, ultimately you're stepping into a greater connection with your body. You know exactly what is supposed to be working at that time. It's active. It's not this passive pose that you're allowing yourself to sit in. And then from there, you can build strength on that foundation of stability. Yeah, it's also learning about our body. Like one of the things that makes me crazy is yoga teachers that say, listen to your body because the, I mean, most yoga teachers don't understand the language of the body, number one. And number two, if they don't understand it, their students definitely don't understand it. They don't know how to interpret pain um, and they don't know how to in interpret like sensation. It's like, you know, me, an English speaking person trying to listen to somebody speaking Japanese. I don't know Japanese. I can listen, but I don't understand what I'm hearing. And so part of it is learning what is the language of your body? What is the pain actually telling you? No, you shouldn't try to push through it because that's going to create more stress trauma right. in your body. But understanding like, okay, why is that pain there? What do I need to do? What, where is the instability sourced in so that I can go in and, and address it? Right. So what can we do to improve this relationship between the yoga teacher and the students? I've always believed that there's there's a sense of responsibility for the student to find the right teacher. And whenever yeah. anyone would call me generally in the past to ask about service and I would explain what I what I do, I would also tell them, call other people and, and see how you feel. Just just get a get a feel for what else is out there. What are their qualifications? What is what are their experience and not just necessarily focusing on price or focusing on location as being the reasons why you would choose something. So do you believe that there is a sense of responsibility that students have to find the right environment? And if that is the case, then what kind of environment should they be looking for to make sure that they're not going to injure themselves and that they're with somebody who's who they can be in a safe space with? There's so much to unpack in this question. <laughs> you always ask these loaded questions. It's like a um, question time is like, you know, five, but you're. <laughs> so, so there's, it's, I, it's really hard for me to give people advice on who they should find as a teacher. Um, definitely the kind of person you want to look for in a teacher is somebody who you want to start to aspire to be, you know, and I'm not talking about necessarily their lifestyle, but who they are as a person, what are they projecting? Are they projecting happiness? You know, um, are they projecting joy? And so are they projecting those kind of kind quality and compassionate qualities that you want to, you know, em embody? And then you kind of want to look for a teacher that, you know, is it like you go to some yoga teachers classes and it's like, they're putting on a show it's a show and and it's really all about them what i always tell people is you do not want a teacher you want to walk you want to find a teacher who's walking around the room and looking at you and guiding you preferably you want a teacher that's also not teaching child's pose but that's like hard to find so you kind of have to <laughs> you know adjust with that i also would encourage people to find teachers who are not adjusting like doing hands-on adjustments there's probably if we took a hundred thousand yoga teachers you would be hard pressed to find maybe you know a hundred that knew how to adjust somebody properly and knew what they were doing when it came came to hands-on manipulation and i would even say that probably not even a hundred of them knew what they were doing it's just you just don't want people manipulating your body because that also adds to the amount of quote unquote yoga related injuries that are out there so i would i would encourage you you to also find a teacher that knows something about yoga and that's hard to understand because you as a student and when I say you I'm talking about the people yeah. listening as a students don't know much about yoga that's why they're going to a teacher so two things kind of have to be true at the same time one you want to find somebody who knows something about yoga but also you need to start educating yourself about yoga and a great place to do that is in stop stretching podcast <laughs> that is a great podcast i the last episode i, I think I was, I was just sharing with you um was was the one about the dark side of yoga 
right? Yes. And that was, I mean, that was super eye-opening. And there's a really great film on Netflix too um, that I think, you know, maybe people could, if they have access to it, could watch it. And just to learn a little bit about about just being in that that powerful position of a teacher where you are you are influential where you're you are creating massive impact and sometimes that ne that might not not necessarily be a positive impact but because you're so influential and powerful that you can almost get away with anything right yeah. and so have you experienced that and just you know been in that sort of environment also throughout your practice i know you've been doing this for a long time have you seen anything like that firsthand because it seems like it was a very passionate topic for you to share and to include in, in your podcast. I mean, I've seen so many people come to Blue Osa and, you know, have different attitudes towards me, but some of them are definitely people who are longing to, you know, have some, something within them be filled up. Yeah. And, um, and it, you know, as a teacher and, and my, you know, I've had colleagues and I who have gotten into big arguments about this and said, you know, it's, it's the job of the teacher to be very aware of it. And yes, I think that can be true. It's also the job of the student to be aware of why they're going to um, the teacher and what is it that they're looking to be filled and understanding the teacher will never give that to you. And if they do, or if there's the feeling that they do, then it's, it's, it's an illusion because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they're not really doing it. You've got to do the work yourself. And I think that's what we need to be preaching, you know, with all of this kind of conversation out there about abuse and yoga, we've never talked about what are students really looking for. I think that also has to be part of the conversation and really like educating people, at least, I don't know if that's the right word, but but putting it out there for people to understand what is it that's missing in me that I'm looking for and understand that I will never get that in another person. I have to find it on my own. And, and I've just seen, I've seen it time and time again. And is I always warn my yoga teachers in training, like as quickly as a student will build you up, they will tear you down even faster. And we've seen that play itself out a lot in the yoga world but i've also experienced that numerous amount of times you know i've had people be the most devoted people i think there was actually a person in your training that was like that and then all of a sudden it's like something just switches and and they want to tear you down because they're disappointed that their own expectations were never met it's not my job to fill expectations for a student my job as a yoga teacher is just to guide people in yoga, you know, hey, guys, we're going to sit here for five minutes and breathe. And I want you to breathe in this way. In this, in, in this way, my role then is to hold a safe mm -hmm. and compassionate space for the students to evolve in their own uh, process. But it's not my job to fill their, their expectations um, or, or play some sort of other role for them. You know, and, and I don't know if there's people that are listening to this, but I always tell teachers, like, separate yourself from your students. So that way your students understand that there is a line um, of, and you can call it many different words, but one of them could be professionalism. It keeps mm -hmm. that professionalism um, very, very, very clear and clean. We like a clean space, right. no agendas. Right. There, there definitely should be some set boundaries. And by the way, Aaron, I think you do a great job in holding space for people. And I remember one of the first things that you share with people is really to not have attachments. You're here to transform from the inside out. It's not, it's not holding an expectation on, on the place, on, on what you're going to be taught. It's, it's really your own transformation. And I've been there now twice and I've seen both times by the end. I mean, you've also seen me fall apart by the, by, I think it was like day 12 <laughs> usually, you know, but because I am transforming, there's, there's something that's happening from, from within me. And I actually come without any expectations. I have no idea what's going to go down and, and whatever is supposed to transpire is going to, and I don't know what I'm, I'm really going there for, but I know I'm going to leave with exactly what I need. And I think just to your point about having a mentor, that ends up being the danger is that you think your mentor is going to guide your life. But the truth is you're going to guide your own life and the mentor is only going to put a mirror in front of you. It's, it's a reflection of who you are and what you really want to create in your life ultimately that becomes your guide. And so 
it's a great sense of responsibility too as as someone's teacher or someone's coach to feel that you are responsible for for their transformation and it's definitely something i always you know say to my athletes when they thank me for their transformation i remind them that it wasn't me it was actually you like i showed you the tools and you did the work and ultimately i think as as fitness teachers as as yoga teachers um, as anyone who's in that mentorship state, that's, that's ultimately the message is that the transformation is really coming from the student's end. Absolutely. It's, it's all about the students. And again, we're just like, you know, it's like, um, <clears throat> I kind of like think about it, like we're in a dark forest, you know, a pitch black forest and the teacher is holding the light mm -hmm. and the teacher says, you can go down this path, this path or this path. And if you want to, you can find your own path, but this is the, these are the three that I suggest, you know, but it's your choice. You, you have to walk down it. And I think a lot of people in the world don't even start walking. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, every time I hear this kind of like, it's your own practice, do what you want to do. What I kind of sometimes in, translate that is, is people just like, well, I don't like those three paths. I'm going to take my own. It's like, okay, goodbye. <laughs> you know, you're right. It's your journey. It's your life. Um, but uh, as teachers, our power as teachers comes from that direct experience of our own practice. Mm -hmm. And if we can cultivate that own like inner knowingness, I call it. Um, you know, that direct experience of oneness, then it informs the way that we teach. We teach from a very different place. It's no longer like guessing, you know, the path or it's guessing the practices. We know, you know, what we know because we know. I know that these ayama practices and muscle activations work because I've done it and I can speak from that authority. And so as, as teachers, we have an obligation to not just teach what we think we know, but teach from direct experience, which can only be cultivated from actually living that kind of life and doing that kind of practice. Absolutely. And that's, that's, I think the most authentic space anyways, and, and in which we can, we can actually share from. So yes. how can we start to switch the script? So let's say we wanted to start talking to, well, first of all, I, I, I believe your, your book and your podcast is making a massive impact, but how can we start to, to continue that and continue this discussion where now fitness trainers are more open to starting to maybe shift a little bit of their, their philosophies around stretching and the same thing with, with yogis in general, where, where can we start to implement that work? One of the reasons why I created the book and, and created the podcast was like for people to start sharing it with their teachers, to start sharing it with their fitness instructors and say, hey, I'm doing this new thing or I'm I'm not stretching anymore. And here's why. Um, and, and to try and give people like an actual resource that they can pass on, not just something that is kind of like he said, she said, um, but actual, like something that's backed up. I think that's one place to start. I think that people unfortunately are going to, you know, once you start doing these practices, it's hard to, you know, it's like, for example, me, I really want to find a fitness teacher, a fitness trainer, but now I'm like, I don't want a fitness trainer. I want somebody who knows something about the body. And I'm sad to say, like, I, you know, if, let me say it this way. If someone picks up a copy of my book and reads it from front to back and actually spends, you know, a couple of months going through the practices and understanding the different muscles, they will have more knowledge than most doctors even of muscle function. I'm, I'm putting a caveat on that muscle function. There's so many people that just lack so much knowledge. And so I think that the first thing to do is just empower yourself with the material, start understanding, start experimenting. You know, that's one of the other key words is experimentation. You know, seeing what kind of works for your body, you'll know very quickly because your body will tell you if, if it's not working because you'll be in pain or mm -hmm. you'll have pain in your joint or you'll do, you'll do some practices and then afterwards you go for a walk and then you'll come back and go, okay, there's some stiffness here. I need to address that. What does Yogi Aaron say and stop stretching about stiffness? Right. And in this way, we start to get that experience herself. 
And I think like, that's how we start to affect change is like, be the change that we want to be. And then also start to share it with other people. So um, that's, I mean, that's maybe not the answer you're looking for, but that's what I got. <laughs> no, spot on. And and also, as, I think as a warning, you should probably warn people on your podcast and on the book, like, you can never go back. Once you stop stretching and stop activating, <laughs> you can never go back. <laughs> yes, right? yes. Forget everything else you learned. It's It's funny to me to kind of, actually, Sherry, I'm starting to see on YouTube, as I'm, you know, as you know, I'm doing a lot of content creation. So I'm looking to see what other people are doing and, you know, stimulating ideas and that sort of thing. One of the things I find really fascinating is how many people now are starting to put this out there and actually telling people to stop stretching. So it is out there, but there's still this addiction to the stretching part. It blows my mind. Like, you know, this one, one uh, yoga teacher I'm, f I'm following on YouTube, uh, again, more for inspiration, but I also like the way that she puts together content, but she'll sit there at the beginning of the video and rattle off all these statistics about how stretching is hurting people. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, but we do want to get more range of motion in our hamstrings, you know, and it's like, why? <laughs> like, right. So there's this addiction to stretching and in even people, this is what blows my mind to be quite frank is like, once people understand muscle function in these industries, they go back to, yeah, but then we have to defy muscle, muscle function. And then let's elongate these muscles. And it's like, no, that's not their job. Their job is to shorten, not to elongate right. anyway. <laughs> yeah, no. You can tell I'm passionate about it. <laughs> Not at all. No, it doesn't show. <laughs> so, so someone listening who's who's like, well, you know, I I do ballet or I do pole fitness or I do gymnastics or I do a sport that requires flexibility. What is what is sort of the support that you can share for them so that they don't injure themselves, but they can still continue to have that range of motion that they need for their sport and then, you know, activate at the same time. Well, it depends on who we're talking about. You know, I think that's important because when you're 16, 17, 18, you know, and you look at gymnasts right. and you, these kids, they, they need range of motion. But the thing is that real, real range of motion. And when the way I define range of motion, the way that, that we define it in sort of an Ayama philosophy, if you will, real range of motion is when you have range of motion, um, you have, you know, you have movement at a joint, but there's also stability. That means that when you bring your arm to a certain place that you need it to be there, that you actually can hold it there and in the muscle can contract properly. It's contracting and contracting on demand. But if you just kind of force a range of motion, there's no stability. There's no accountability. There's actually this woman, um, her name is Sue Mays, and I believe she's the director or was the director of the Australian Ballet Company. Mm -hmm. And she actually said that we have eliminated the word stretching and flexibility. And the way that she gets her, her gymnasts, sorry, her ballerinas to open up their range of motion is actually through getting the muscles to work properly. And sometimes they use the word dynamic stretching. So an example of dynamic stretching is if you're standing and you're like a ballerina and you bring one leg up, a lot of people will grab their foot and try and bring the foot up as high as they can. So you're forcing a range of motion, but it's coming from an external source, this being your hand. But what you really want to do is just keep working the leg up on its own, you know, and, and so now you're using the muscles to lift the leg rather than lifting from an external source. So that's like the best way to start building range of motion. And, you know, for a lot of people that go, well, gymnasts, you know, they have all kinds of strength and power and blah, blah, blah. First of all, yeah, they're 16 years old. Right. Hello, like at 16, we all had that kind of, you know, mobility and strength if it was cultivated. But second point, and this is the most important point is you never see a gymnast surviving past 22, right. 24, maybe 26. I mean, you look at Simone Biles, I think she was 25 or 26 mm -hmm. and look at the breakdown that she had. And, you know, whatever aside, the point is, is that that beats our uh, beats us up at a neuromuscular level. And there's a price that we're going to pay. And you never look at like, 
even like a bunch, a lineup of gymnasts who are 20, 22 years old, they all have ice bandages, you know, ice packs, heating packs, you know, wraps around their knees because there's so much instability that was just forced by overstretching, by creating ranges of motion that wasn't done with any sense of accountability. So when we're working on an opening up range of motion, the, the answer isn't through stretching. The answer is through improving uh, the muscle function um, of the muscles that are supporting that joint. Wow. So well said. I love that. Wow. <laughs> so is there anything else as as we're just nearing the end of, of our time here together today, just for today? Um, is there anything else that you want you wanted to you share? You and I can talk a lot about I this. know, so can I? I'm like, what? Like, how did we already record 35 minutes? Yeah. So no, I, I just really want to tell people, like, first of all, get the book. It's on Amazon. Um, it'll change your life. Um, second of all, you know, just take commit to taking like 10 minutes a day. I mean, once you start doing this stuff, you start understanding like, oh my God, I actually want to do more because it feels good. A lot of people don't like to quote unquote stretch because it actually causes them pain. I mean, you look at like people with, with tight hamstrings, but just taking 10 minutes a day to do these muscle activations, you'll have more mobility, more range of motion. You'll have more strength in your body and you just feel better, you know, and you move through life easier mm -hmm. and then if you move through life easier you're just happy <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely so if somebody wanted to reach out to you aaron where can they go to do that and, and where could they go to find your youtube videos as well so go to my youtube channel and just search yogi aaron aaron is with two a's a-a-r-o-n um they can also go to my website uh yogi aaron.com uh, again, two A's. And um, you can also, again, find my book on Amazon. Just search Stop Stretching. In fact, if you Google search Stop Stretching, you'll probably find me plastered everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for this conversation today, Erin. I loved it. Thank you so much for having me back, Sherry. Can't wait to have you back at Bluosa next year. Yes, coming soon. <laughs> Can't wait.